uh, well, if he was hired by M. M. Mooring, which Boring, I think he yeah. was, he was in the engineering laboratory. Right, and of course, the good story about Cy is he was hired for his violin playing. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. It's, I've got a book by him, and in, in which he describes that first year, uh, uh, first few years in Schenectady, and uh, who was the uh, president of Caltech, uh, Michelson? I think Michelson of the Michelson Morley experiment, and Michelson uh, had a dinner for for a Boring, who was visiting. Even though they weren't hiring, but they thought they ought to go every year, and he had a he had a dinner, and he had Cy Ramo and a pianist provide some background music, and uh, that was Michelson's idea to get Ramo hired. I think I don't know, but anyhow. Uh, Boring, I think, said we just formed a yeah the Schenectady Symphony just formed in 1935, hmm. and somehow Boring I don't know if he was on the board or what but he says we need violinists, <laughs> so he hired a Cy I think on the basis of his violin playing, and of course he really hired a gem there. Uh, Cy's uh, technical uh, accomplishments are are tremendous. We had, it was all obviously government contract work during the war, and they had to beef up everything, engineering, uh, production, any, every, every function of a company had to be beefed up in a hurry to get things out in a hurry. And the, the word in those days was not how much does it cost, just get it done, we don't care how much it costs. So we had to pile people in places that, that were not normally considered to be a typical layout. And that's how I got to be next to these high power guys because that's where, where the room was. It was in building 37 and there was Ramon and there was Winery. And it, as you see the guy next to, on your desk, you get a picture of his personality because he's talking to you off and on about things. And that's what I was telling you about. Uh, Ramo had a, a very, an idea a minute type of guy. A little bit aggressive. He wasn't mean, he just was aggressive because he had all these good ideas. And so it turns out that this fellow John Winery, who had come on, sat again in the same area, was the kind of a guy who could carry through on a job, on an idea. The company authorized the, the two of them to create a book on electromagnetic technology that people could read, engineers, and, and apply to the job. To the average uh, engineer growing up, I think Ramo is best known for his books. Oh, yeah. At Stanford, uh, Les Field taught out of Ramo's book, yeah. and I, I was in his class. Uh, Fields and Waves in Modern Radio, a very <laughs> strange title. Fields and waves in modern radio. I say we were the beta testers in the fact they had, they taught the course and chapter by chapter we would be taught the course and they would go back and debug it or whatever. Uh, and it finally got published. That book is a well-worn book. that has Scott Shape holding the back of it together because it was a reference book. It's not a, it's not a, a handbook. But each chapter is devoted to a topic like antennas and gener power generators and controllers and so forth. And if you want to get started on a job, you just look, start with that one and then you could do your calculations based on the equations that they had. And the, the equations in there were not mathematician esoteric equations that looked good on a blackboard, but ones that you could actually use. <laughs> so. We did that, and uh, we, a whole bunch of us enjoyed it, enjoyed that particular book. But at the time, it, it filled a very needed niche in the world. The, 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 the one book existing on electromagnetic technology was written by a guy at Beltau Bell Labs, and it was great in terms of all of the theory and stuff, but it wasn't aimed at the user. It was aimed at a guy who wanted to just be in pure, so-called pure science rather than applied science. And uh, 
uh, a fellow named Shelkanoff. And uh, we started with that, but then, as I say, this one book here was, it was our hand, it was our back pocket book here. <laughs> Whenever you had a problem, you just reach for it and see what, what, what can we find out about that. And of course, I had the advantage of having the two authors sitting right there. <laughs> if I had any problems with the book, I'd say, hey, how about this? And then they would do it. We had a, a very dynamic environment, as I kept keep saying in the war. We had to get a job done, no matter how much it cost, just do it. And so a lot of things got done. A lot of things, we obviously we made a bunch of mistakes too, but there were more positive results than negative results. I know he went out and worked for, for Hughes Aircraft. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he worked for Hughes, and evidently Hughes was a very uh, undependable guy, you yeah. know, yeah. Uh, and and the way I read it in, in Ramo's book was that uh, the, the Defense Department approached Ramo and Wooldridge and said, if you would form a company independent of Hughes, we will give you contracts. Oh. That's the way I understand it. And, uh, but TRW, I think, uh, more as an automotive supplier. Today, yeah. Today. Yeah, but in those, in those days, they were involved with the missiles. Sending. More like a Lockheed or something. Yeah, yeah. And so when it came to uh, people learn how to la launch uh, satellites, uh, you wanted to have something up there that would last. Obviously, you can't go fix that up there. So uh, we got involved in tubes that would go for, for uh, satellite use. And uh, uh, that's how I got to actually go out and visit Gaines, back here again to Ramo, visit TRW, and I had a government contract to test the reliability of traveling wave tubes that was being installed in a TRW system that was going on a satellite.